They say that knowledge is power, and I think that knowledge products really give us the power to empower other actors, whether they're peacekeepers, peacemakers, legislators, or other actors from other sectors. I have actually been with this mandate since its inception, and I've seen how strategic knowledge products can generate the skill and the will to deliver a more effective response, particularly when they're demand-driven and field-focused. So over the years, our mandate has pioneered a number of transformative tools, each of which has really filled an analytical, operational, or practical gap. And the way I've thought about this over the years is in terms of filling a gap on the bookshelf for the next generation of practitioners, who, and also engaging new constituencies in this field who may not have been fully cognizant or convinced of the relevance of integrating sexual violence into their work. So in that spirit, Norway has been a um, key collaborator with UN partners in developing a new handbook for peacekeeping personnel to bolster their ability to address conflict-related sexual violence, taking a survivor-centered and whole-of-mission approach. And I should also mention that Norway has really been an angel investor in this mandate from day one um, and has really helped to drive the field forward. So to elaborate on their work, I'm really honored to give the floor to the Norwegian State Secretary of Defense, Her Excellency Tona Skorgen. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, and good afternoon to all of you, um, excellencies, dear colleagues, and friends. Conflict-related sexual violence has long been seen as an inevitable but regrettable consequence of conflict. However, as shown by the testimonies we have heard today, conflict-related sexual violence is not inevitable. It is used as a deliberate weapon of war, a weapon targeted specifically at civilians, at women, girls, men, and boys. The courageous women and men who have come forward as survivors of conflict-related sexual violence have set CRSV high on the international agenda. Your brave testimonies, including the ones that we have heard today, makes it possible to fight this scorch. Thank you for your courage and strength. The perpetrators of CRSV have long relied on the stigma surrounding sexual violence to make it a more effective weapon. By upholding the silence, the destructive effects are multiplied, not only for individual survivors, but also for their families, communities, and countries. CRSV erodes the very fabric of society and it undermines efforts to achieve sustainable peace, security, and stability. One way of reducing its devastating impact is breaking the silence and taboos. I applaud all survivors for speaking up about the horrors you have endured. Representing the international community, we must work harder to address sexual violence in conflict and support survivors. CRSV is a violation of both international human rights law and international humanitarian law. As witnessed in multiple contexts around the world, it can be a war crime, a crime against humanity, as well as an act of genocide. Despite this, Perpetrators have far too often been able to act with impunity. This must end. Norway commends the UN Security Council for adopting Resolution 2467, which represents a milestone in our common efforts to prevent and counter CRSV. The resolution strengthens prevention through justice and accountability, and affirms the need for a survivor-centered approach. With this in place, we must continue to ensure that CRSV is addressed in all UN peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding initiatives on the ground. It must be included in all security and justice sector reform efforts, 
as well as in negotiations of peace agreements and ceasefire verification mechanisms. Turning promises into practice and resolutions into solutions is crucial. Norway strongly believes in the need to turn resolutions into solutions. And that is why Norway is developing a whole omission handbook on the prevention and response to CRSV, CRSV for UN peace operations. However, this is not something we do alone. On the contrary, we work closely with several partners. The United Nations Department of Peace Operations, the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict all partake in this effort. The handbook will serve as a practical guide for all UN peacekeepers to enhance the efforts of US peacekeeping and special political missions to prevent and respond to CRSV on the ground. The handbook is based on good practices, lessons learned, and recommendations from UN peace operations. Thus, it will give civilian, military, and police peacekeepers concrete tools to improve coordination enhance community engagement, and address impunity. All with a survivor-centered approach. The handbook will be launched and put into practice in all UN oper peace operations early next year, aiming to contribute towards lasting changes on the ground. Norway also welcomes the launch of the International Fund for Survivors of Conflict-Related Sexual Violence, led by Nobel Peace Prize laureates Dr. Dennis McVeigh and Nadia Murad. The fund will provide survivors of conflict-related sexual violence with better access to reparations and other forms of redress. It will help survivors reintegrate fully into their communities. We firmly support this important survivor-centered initiative and will support this fund. We commit to join SRSG Patton, Dr. Mukhege, Nadia Murad, and other partners to ensure survivors are being cared for, their rights are respected, and the reprehensible acts of sexual violence in conflict come to an end. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Excellency. And our office highly commends and recommends this new handbook uh, as an extremely useful resource. And indeed, I remember back in 2008 when we were first compiling an inventory of good practices by peacekeepers to better detect and deter and respond to conflict-related sexual violence. One peacekeeper operating in Darfur said, if you want me to fly, first give me the wings, then you can say whether I flew well. So these kind of tools really equip peacekeepers with the examples and the inspiration to rise to the challenge of ever-changing, ever more challenging mandates, rather than being paralyzed in the face of operational complexity. In this issue, we really also know that the best response of all is prevention. And prosecution is a key facet of prevention. Justice and accountability is critical to deterrence, whereas we know impunity is tantamount to license to rape. So in another knowledge product that our office has commissioned uh, this year, we are working to um, help member states to strengthen their legislative framework to bring it into line with international standards and ensure it is as up-to-date as possible, including um, up-to-date with the ever-evolving framework of Security Council resolutions. The genesis of this second project we'll talk about now was actually that over 10 years of practice, national authorities expressed interest 
and a need uh, to our office of having a tool that would help them to align their national framework with international best practice standards. And the hope is that this new model legislation and, and legislative guidance commissioned by our office will catalyze that process in diverse national contexts. So to tell us about this new resource, uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Maxine Marcus, who is the founder and director of the Transitional Justice Clinic. She is an international crimes prosecutor and investigator with extensive experience in this field and has been collaborating with our office as a special consultant. Max, you have the floor. Thank you, Letitia. Sincere thanks to SRSG Patton for the privilege of joining with you today. Several years ago, I was part of a team preparing a case involving grave crimes, including conflict-related sexual violence, for prosecution. One survivor who had testified in a number of previous cases was reported to be experiencing severe trauma. It was recommended that she not be asked to testify, uh, as it would cause her too much harm. I tried to find alternative evidence to prove that incident and that crime, but I was unable to do so. And prior to asking for that incident to be removed from the indictment, I traveled to visit this survivor and talked to her in person in the location where she had been relocated to. We spent the first half of the day talking about our families, sharing thoughts and, and feelings. And just after lunch, she said to me, so when do you want me? And I looked at her and said, well, it was my understanding that you would not wish to testify because it would be potentially quite upsetting to you and have a real negative impact on you. And she looked at me and she took my arm and she said, they killed my brother. They killed my father. I want to testify. When do you want me? In the course of my 20 plus years of work as an investigator and prosecutor of conflict-related sexual violence, I have learned from survivors directly this key lesson. Nothing about them without them is for them. We simply cannot work on behalf of survivors without the direct engagement of the survivors. That's what victim-centered justice really means in practice. Even with the best of intentions, it means that each step on the path toward accountability must be informed by direct consultation with and involvement of the survivors. They are the beneficiaries of the justice process. What is it that drives the reluctance to hold perpetrators of CRSV accountable? What is it about sexual violence that makes it seem so difficult to investigate and prosecute? I'm the director of the Transitional Justice Clinic. The TJ Clinic is a mobile clinic of practitioners. We provide peer-to-peer -peer mentoring for national prosecutors, investigators, and victim representatives at their request to help them overcome real and perceived obstacles to the investigation and prosecution of CRSV in national courts. In the course of our work, peers in the field, prosecutors, investigators, and victim lawyers from all over the world have asked for help, just as Letitia pointed out, in bringing justice for conflict-related sexual violence and other grave crimes. We have seen the challenges they are facing up close, and we've developed some concrete, practical tools to help them bring victim-centered justice. The SRSG's office is pioneering knowledge products that support this change in practice. The legislative guidance on CRSV, which we were commissioned to draft by the SRSG, is a tool to help our colleagues in national jurisdictions to overcome obstacles in ensuring accountability for CRSV. The legislative guidance adopts a victim and survivor-centered approach which means it prioritizes the rights, needs, and wishes of the victim or survivor of sexual violence. 
To inform the guidance, we studied the relevant national criminal and procedural provisions from 27 states, representing a non-exhaustive, but nonetheless wide range of legal traditions and geographic locations. Many of the states whose laws were reviewed and analyzed have adopted legislation aimed at addressing international crimes, and several of these states' courts have held trials on that basis. The guidance provides options for common law, civil law, and hybrid systems, and it is adaptable for use in informal and customary justice contexts as well. The legislative guidance was further informed by the expertise of academics and established practitioners in the areas of conflict-related sexual violence, international criminal law, and victim-centered litigation, as well as by survivors of sexual violence and other atrocities themselves, including those who have participated in litigation against their perpetrators. The guidance is currently the subject of internal consultation within the UN system, and once all key agencies have provided their critical input, the final product will be published and shared. Let me underline this point. This tool was prepared with the survivors, and thus it is about and for the survivors. It is our sincere hope that it will be the sort of tool that our colleagues in national jurisdictions can use to bring survivor-centered justice for grave crimes involving sexual violence. The guidance sets out crimes such as sexual violence as an act of genocide and sexual violence as an act of terrorism, reflecting the most advanced standards. It allows for the widest range of possible violations that survivors may wish to have adjudicated in cases which are brought on their behalf. The tool contains all those elements that are truly necessary to prosecute these crimes and empower the victims, elements we have learned over the last 10 years since the SRSG's mandate came into effect. The guidance ensures that the justice system will not only do no harm, but will actually do it right. Victims and survivors of CRSV have been disempowered by their perpetrators, and putting them in the driver's seat in the justice process puts the power back into their hands where it belongs. Victims and survivors deserve justice close to home, justice which involves them and includes them, justice which empowers rather than sacrifices them, justice which honors their courage and respects their constraints, justice which considers their needs as a core consideration rather than as an afterthought, justice which uplifts them rather than further victimizing them, justice which paves the path for other victims to come forward, and justice which is accessible, tangible, visible, and transformative. Thank you so much. Uh, many thanks, Max, for your incredible work and incredible words. I think today we have helped to fill two gaps on the bookshelf, and both of those products will be made available in the new year. I would also just share with you that our office has also produced a synthesis report of the broad patterns and trends of conflict-related sexual violence from 2008 to the present as a contribution to the UN's institutional memory as another tool that we've developed for this occasion. Um, just by way of wrap up, I would really emphasize that each new conceptual breakthrough we've seen in this agenda has been mirrored by a practical how-to guideline. So for example, in recognizing sexual violence as a security threat that warrants a security response, we saw the development of scenario-based training for peacekeepers that was immersive and eye-opening and operational, not just abstract and theoretical. In recognizing that sexual violence is not inevitable and debunking that myth, and recognizing it's preventable, we saw the development of early warning indicators to help field-based monitors detect red flags and spikes in sexual violence in their areas of operation for a real-time or early response. And in recognizing that sexual violence is not only a humanitarian issue, but also a political issue, 
that cannot be amnestied in the context of peace processes as a so-called pr price of peace, we saw the development led by DPPA of guidance for mediators on addressing conflict-related sexual violence in ceasefire and peace agreements. So these knowledge products have taken us step by step to a transformative approach in institutional practice and cultures. And I think everyone here has a role to play in publicizing, disseminating, and using all of these re resources uh, as enablers of progress and change. So thank you very much for that. Thank you.